Welcome back to Your Health Radio and Television Program. I'm Dr. David Morwood. I am a board-certified plastic surgeon, and I'm very delighted to welcome back to the program Dr. Ron Friedman, ophthalmologist. Always a pleasure to come back and talk about eyes. Dr. Friedman, eye physician and eye surgeon, really a pleasure to have you on here. Dr. Friedman, what I want to do is recap the training that you would undergo or a young person would undergo if they wanted to be an ophthalmologist. Can you go over that again for us? Well, after high school, we go through a college program and take a pre-medical degree. Usually that's a four-year program, and students will either major in biology or chemistry, typically, with specific courses that are required for medical school. And as you know, you go into medical school, and that's a four-year program where you do a uh, study of all parts of the body. You go through what we call clinical rotations. And then after four years of medical school, you do a general uh, internship for one year where you again study all the different parts of the body and the diseases and then finally you get to study just the eyes for three years in what we call an ophthalmology residency program. Well Dr. Friedman, I recall when I was in medical school a couple of the most competitive training programs to get into were plastic surgery and ophthalmology of course. Yeah. Not, I, I think the are very competitive and you I think you have to have not only good physical skills good high eye hand coordination but but get good grades as well there's something about um, the eyes that attracts people with with uh, a mathematical uh, ability and also people that uh, have visual uh, visual uh, appeal because the eye lends itself obviously to visual inspection and yet we deal with numbers all the time and calculating people's glasses and of course as we'll talk today about people's implant powers for cataract surgery. Okay, Dr. Friedman, I appreciate that segue into our topic for today and our topic for today is advances in the treatment of cataracts. Mm -hmm. So let's start off by teaching our viewers and our, li our listeners exactly what is a cataract. Okay, a cataract is when the lens inside the eye uh, becomes cloudy, and it does so gradually over a great number of years. And as I'll show you in this little picture here, in order to fully see the cataract, one has to put drops in to dilate the eye. And if you look, you see that the lens inside the eye has become cloudy. Often it becomes brown, often it becomes speckled with white opacities, and in rare cases it can become completely opaque, completely white. So this is, in a dilated pupil, what the lens would look like when it becomes cloudy. A lot of people confuse cataracts with things that grow on, on the outside of the eye, most commonly growths called pterygiums, but actually a cataract is the lens inside the eye that has become cloudy. Okay, now Dr. Friedman, this is very valuable. For our listeners who are listening to us on the radio, the, the, the very outside of the eyeball, that's the cornea, That's correct? the cornea, the, the clear part of the eye, which people often think is the colored part because they're seeing the iris, the colored part, through the cornea. But the cornea is the window of the eye, the clear part. Okay, now see, we could talk about this for hours, mostly because I learned a lot fr from you. So, <coughs> so the outside of the, the clear part is the cornea, and then you mentioned this word iris. Now, is that like a, a shutter or a diaphragm? What's the exactly iris, the iris? If you compare the eye to the camera, and the eye and the camera are always a good analogy, since the camera was, of course, modeled after an eye. The <coughs> the iris is the shutter of the camera that regulates the amount of light that comes in and out uh, automatically by neural impulses. Okay, so in back of the iris, that's the lens that we're talking about. Correct. Correct, and that lens actually uh, provides the fine tuning the focus of the eye. Most people believe that the lens in the eye does all the focusing, but it actually it is only there to fine tune uh, 15 to 25 percent of the focusing of the eye. Well, see, okay, now, now, as a plastic surgeon, I take hundreds of photographs, sometimes in a week, certainly in a month. Now, when, when my camera focuses on something up close, like the hand, it, it has to adjust if I pick the camera up and want to take a picture of something far away, right? So how does the eyeball differentiate or focus on a hand up close and then focuses, focus on something far away? How does it do that? Well, the, the, the retina senses an image and the brain wants to pull that image into focus. And it, in a sense, cameras are modeled. The autofocus of a camera is modeled after the autofocus of the brain, where the stimulus for clarity that the retina, the film of the camera perceives, is automatically transmitted through nerves to the muscles of the iris and also the muscles of the lens. So the iris will, will constrict 
and the lens will round to get that object into focus. And it happens in one sixtieth to one two hundredth of a second. It's very fast. Okay, so there are actual mechanical changes in the eyeball that can help you focus on something up yes. close as opposed to far away. Yes. Okay, so you started to say that it's that lens mm -hmm. that becomes cloudy mm -hmm. and that's a cataract. Yes, and, and most people when they start to have some of this early clouding of the lens start to notice it in their distance vision first. Uh, they'll get more glare, uh, trouble reading street signs. On the Monterey Peninsula the typical complaint is trouble following the golf ball, uh, trouble recognizing faces across the street and when it advances enough we get a lot of people that are sent our way from the Department of Motor Vehicle because they fail their driving tests. Okay, Dr. Friedman, by now I know that my viewers and listeners, when we talk about any disease, they want to know what causes it, how can it pre be prevented, and thirdly, when it occurs, how do you treat it? So let's go through those three things. How do cataracts occur? Can they be prevented? And number three, what happens if someone gets a cataract? Uh, most cataracts occur just from the, na from the natural aging process of the lens. The lens is a, an organ that uh, has not evolved evolutionarily to survive uh, as long as we are evolving. And for technical reasons, the lens can grows larger and larger inside the eye and eventually cannot support clarity anymore, so it starts to become cloudy. And we don't consider most people who get cataracts in their 70s or even late 60s and 80s a disease. It's just a natural occurrence of clouding in the lens. How we can prevent it? There's no known prevention for cataracts. Uh, cataracts are associated with a tremendous number of other eye conditions and tremendous number of medications that we can find associations with and maybe intervene in those instances. But in the most typical age-related or what we would call used to call senile cataract, uh, there is no prevention and there's only the cure. Now fortunately the cure is fantastic as, as you may remember when your grandma or my grandmother had cataract surgery she had to wear glasses like this to see clearly. Uh, these are the coke bottle glasses and uh, the, dis the visual disturbances people had from these things were tremendous. If you put them on for a second, you'll see. You can just imagine what it was like to have to wear glasses like that to well, see. Well, again, for the benefit of our viewers, or, or excuse me, of our listeners on the radio, these are like Coke bottle glasses, right? right? Yes. I mean, they're so thick. Well, isn't that amazing? You see, this is like a, a Halloween... Uh, you know, a Halloween costume. What's so. even more amazing that these have disappeared over the last 25 years, that it took, it took us a tremendous effort even to find a pair of these around when, before the 1970s, wearing these was commonplace. The beauty of our science is that in, in 1970, we developed little lenses that we could put inside the eye called implants. And these are very, very fine contact lens-like structures that we surgically implant in the eye that replaces the need for these Coke bottle glasses. Okay, now, now Dr. Friedman, I want to get a little more uh, detail about this. So that cloudy lens must be removed, right. correct? Or do you just simply insert th this lens on top of that? Other? No, we remove the cloudy lens and I'll show you. This, this is a picture uh, of an eye where that cloudy lens as shown in the previous picture has been removed and you can see clearly that the cloudy lens has been taken out and a clear lens has been placed behind the iris. This is so clear in fact that you can't, can't see anything back there. Now the procedure to do this is often confused with a laser procedure, but in fact we cannot take cataracts out with lasers. We use a probe that goes in through a very small incision that sucks the cataract out after breaking it up into little pieces. And then we use a different probe after the lens has been removed completely to put this little implant that I just showed you inside the eye. And that's your cataract implant procedure or modern cataract surgery. Okay, Dr. Friedman, now, see, I'm going to learn a lot during this segment as well. And now, is that what you call phaco or phaco emulsification? That is phaco emulsification. N now, that means it's an operation whereby you go in and you take out somehow take out that diseased lens or the cloudy mm -hmm. lens. Mm -hmm. Now, is that the phaco emulsification? The phaco, the, the, the phaco emulsifier is this probe. And phaco emulsification, phaco is lens, emulsification is to emulsify. So phaco emulsification just means lens emulsifying. But the beauty of this instrument, as it has evolved over the last 30 years, is that it, it emits sound waves that break up the firm lens so it can be sucked out through the small little opening 
uh, in the tip, in the phaco emulsifier tip. Okay, so typically is a patient wide awake or under general anesthesia or numbed up or you just numb up the eye? Like how does that work for, what's the mechanical process for this? Well, one of the greatest advances we've had in the last 10 years in cataract surgery is, is the ability to do this procedure without any stitches and without any deep anesthesia. So the patient walks in off the street about 45 minutes before his procedure. His eye is uh, numbed up with special numbing medicines, uh, lidocaine jellies or drops. And then we give a little bit of relaxing medicine, a little Valium or similar products to take the anxiety off. The procedure itself takes us about 15 minutes. We don't have to put any stitches in. We send the eye out, it's patched for a couple hours, and the patient leaves our surgery center approximately an hour after they walked in the door. Okay, so, and of course it's covered by insurance typically, or it reimburses the patient or something. This is a medical yes. condition, it's yes. not just an elective. Yeah, typically most insurance companies uh, uh, pay the lion's share of a cataract procedure. Okay, so, so the cloudy lens comes out, and at the same time, same sitting, same operation, you can put the new lens in, or is that in the future? No, we do it at the same time. Uh, and the, b the next advance that we can talk about is how these implants have improved over the last 25, 30 years. Fortunately, in, in my training as an ophthalmologist, I never had to prescribe people these, these Coke bottle glasses because I came of age at the same time that these wonderful implants came of age. But it doesn't mean the progress stopped there. In the last 30 years, We've now developed implants that now can allow you not only to see far away, but actually to read without glasses. So many people who come in for their modern implant surgery uh, can leave without needing glasses for driving or for reading the newspaper. And this miracle has uh, brought about a big revolution in our specialty in the last three to five years. So that's an implanted lens that mm -hmm. allows someone to focus on things far away mm -hmm. and also to see and focus on things up close. Correct. We oh. also have ones that can correct astigmatism and we also have ones that can select certain wavelengths of life. So the technology of these implants has, has been uh, a big science and a big business for ophthalmology. So, so again, it's, it's in the same sitting, the same operation. Mm -hmm you'll go in and do what you call a phaco emulsification, take out that cloudy lens that is very difficult to see through, mm -hmm. and insert um, a, a new lens for them. Correct. N now, is it the same lens that everybody gets, or they get a special measurement ahead of time in the office, or it's a custom-designed lens? How does that work? Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> Uh, uh, no two people get the same lens, uh, typically. Uh, there are different styles of lenses. Not everybody chooses to have the bifocal lens. Some people want lenses that give them the best distance vision. We have certain lenses now that, that give people uh, what would be the equivalent of high-definition TV. We have certain lenses now that give people just reading vision only. We have lenses, again, that can correct astigmatism. So uh, we make a, a session dedicated in our office to what we would call lens selection. And the patient comes back and we have a, a device that scientifically measures the eye so I can get not only the style of the lens but the correct power because not every eye would require the same power. And typically this appointment is about a week or 10 days before the actual procedure so that we're sure we have that specific lens uh, in the, the operating theater when we do the procedure. Okay, now let's say someone wears spectacles or contact lenses and, and they know or, or you've prescribed them for years. Let's say they have a 2.5 diopter correction and they develop a cataract over time and you recommend that the cataract be removed and you place a lens. Now, can you accommodate that need for spectacles or contact lens at the same time or will they still yeah. continue to need contacts or spectacles? Uh, absolutely, we, incorpor we incorporate the prescription uh, into the implant, and that, again, depends on the patient's desires. Most people, uh, and I, I, I frame this to them in, in, in this setting, I say, this is your one chance that you might be able to improve on God's work with your eyes. You were made this way, but now you have a one-time chance to change the power of your vision, to change the power of your focus. And that's why it's a pretty significant decision for a lot of patients. I am, of course, there to guide them, tell them uh, what I think, I, I spend a lot of time finding out who they are, what they do, what kind of interests, what their hobbies are, and then I can guide them to the proper lens selection. But it's an important part of the process in modern ophthalmology. Okay, Dr. Friedman, we only have about a minute, and so I, I want to wrap up with a couple other questions. 
But I want to get clear, if a patient needs contacts or spectacles before their cataract operation, will they, will they need that same contact or spectacle correction after the operation, or it may be different? Generally speaking, not. If someone wore corrective lenses before either contacts or glasses, we're going to fix them so they don't need them with the cataract operation at no extra charge. So you can, you can accommodate their need for contact lenses or spectacles, glasses, yes. when you choose the lens for them. Correct. The only option that people have now is in the newer bifocal lenses where they can decide that they want to have it all. They want their far vision and their near vision. And that's, as we would say, a, an a la carte product on the menu. Excellent. Dr. Friedman, before we come to a close, I want to give out a, either a website or a phone number. Do you have something if people have additional questions? Can they call? Can they look up this Absolutely. on the, the website? Well, you know, our office number is 375-2486. And the website is friedmani.com. Okay. So Dr. Ron Friedman, ophthalmologist, eye physician, 375-2486. And once again, your website? www.friedmani.com. Excellent. Well, Dr. Friedman, one of the reasons I like having you on the program, because I learn a lot, I, I appreciate very much you coming on the program. Can I see those spectacles again? <laughs> I, you know, these are uh, quite impressive. I, I'm loving this part. <laughs> and people actually used yeah. to get these. <laughs> Look a little bit like Groucho with those things. Yeah, <laughs> well, you know, I've been accused of that in the past. And uh, I appreciate you coming on the program. Once again, I'm Dr. David Morwood. I'm a board-certified plastic surgeon, and this is your health radio and television program. That was Dr. Ron Friedman, ophthalmologist and eye surgeon. Thanks so much for joining us. Please come back again.